Welcome, silent film fans, to another feature from the New Hollywood Silent Film Festival. In this segment, we'll be talking about silent cowboy star William S. Hart, our new inductee into the New Hollywood Silent Film Hall of Fame. I'm Bill West, and I volunteer for the Friends of Hart Park, a volunteer organization dedicated to preserving the memory of William S. Hart. I'm thrilled to have with me uh, two other Friends of Hart Park in our little panel here, Roger Basham and Jeff Wheat, to discuss Bill Hart. First, let's start with Emmy-winning cameraman, Jeff Wheat. Now, Jeff, tell us a bit about how you became involved with the history of William S. Hart. Well, probably like so many others uh, <clears throat> my age and a little bit younger, uh, we grew up on TV Westerns, the old Bat Mastersons and the Gunsmokes and, and Wyatt Earp and things like that. And uh, that always stuck with me. And over the years, I wanted to learn more about the real people. Uh, and I happened to have picked Wyatt Earp because I wanted to find out who the real person was. Uh, in my search uh, through Wyatt Earp stuff, I realized that he was a, a friend of Bill Hart's. A lot of letters passed back and forth and there was a real relationship there anyway. And I realized, well, Bill Hart's, he's a neighbor. He's just up the street. So I went up there one day looking for more Wyatt Earp information and got hooked on Bill Hart on loving the mansion and... Uh, the fact that he was uh, living in our community uh, read it, really made it more interesting. And I wanted to find more about him uh, as a real person, uh, as well as the legacy uh, that he's left for us. Well, and, and now I'd like to turn to former professor and chairman of the anthropology department of the College of the Canyons, Roger Basham. Roger, how did you cross paths with our favorite cowboy actor, Bill Hart? Came down to the Santa Clarita Valley in 1970, I was one of the uh, founding faculty members at College of the Canyons. And I remember I was living out in Saugus and one Sunday, like so many of us, I went to the swap meet. And as I was uh, perusing through, looking at all of the different uh, tables and wares, I came across a fellow selling a lot of Western items. And on the table was a book and on the, a cowboy on the book and I looked at it it was called My Life East and West The Life Story of William S. Hart. Well I, I knew a little bit about Hart. I, I'd heard you know about uh, Hart Park and the mansion and, and the name and so forth but uh, here's the book and I looked at it and I put it down. I, I didn't buy it and I went on about my shopping. Well I wished I had bought it. Uh, many times I have wished that I had bought it because it was a first edition. Uh, it was a signed first edition even. Well, about 10 years later, uh, I was invited to be a board member uh, on the Friends of Hart Park. This goes back into the, uh, the 1980s. And uh, so I accepted and in doing so, that gave me a chance to really to be around other people who knew something about Bill Hart and to learn from them and to have the experience of being at the park and going through the mansion and things of that type. So I, I kind of came in through the, the back door learning about Bill Hart that way. Now, let me show you, uh, this is a copy of the book. This is an original first edition of the copy of the book that I did not buy at that swap meet. But better than that, if you can see, it also was signed by Bill Hart. Oh, he eventually wrote with his sister 11 books and he signed many of them. Uh, many of them, I think, were given as gifts. Uh, this particular book was obviously a gift addition to somebody. Now, in the beginning of the new Hollywood Silent Film Festival, I spoke about William S. Hart Park and the museum. But this right now is our chance to discuss William S. Hart, the person. Uh, now, I know Hart performed in early silent movies, but was Hart the first actor to play a cowboy in silent films? No, he wasn't. Uh, not by any means. I uh, looked back uh, and there were probably about two dozen people, actors, actresses, directors, that were heavily involved in the making of Western films in the first decade of the 1900s. But by about 1913, uh, I was able to find that at least 60 Western movies had been filmed. Oh. So it was a very popular type subject of, uh, of movies early on, 
But by that time, they pretty well decimated it. Uh, the acting was poor. The scripts, of course, they're all silent, but, but the plots were poor and so forth. Now, this was 1913, about 60 Westerns, as I said, were done. This was at the same time that Bill Hart was kind of ending his theater career. Uh, he had been on a legitimate stage. And after 1900, he started playing in Western plays. Uh, the Squaw Man being one of the first ones. Uh, that was about 1903 that he was in The Squaw Man. Uh, a few years later, he was in The Virginian. And then a couple of years after that, uh, they're very well known, The Trail of the Lonesome Pine. So about 1911, as the story goes, and this is what Bill uh, tells us in his autobiography, he was in Cleveland and he was doing a play. In fact, it was The Trail of the Lonesome Pine. And he went to the movie theater and there was a Western that was playing. And he sat there and watched it and thought, this is awful. <laughs> What he said in his autobiography, he said, it was awful. The actors were dressed like a cross between uh, a, a logger and an English fisherman. And, <laughs> and he said, this is terrible. He said, I was an actor. I, I knew the West. Uh, I had been there. I had now the opportunity uh, to do what I wanted to do. And it came knocking at my door. So it was the scene of this awful film that gave him the idea that maybe I should be in the movies and maybe I should be doing Westerns. So if we jump ahead to 1913, the opportunity comes up. His play is coming out to the West Coast. They travel to Los Angeles and there he makes a phone call that will alter his life. He calls one of his old friends from the New York stage, in fact, a, an old roommate, Thomas Ince, and you might have heard of him. Yeah. Well, Ince was running what was called the New York Motion Picture Company. And Hart gets him on the phone and, you know, hi, uh, hi, Tom, hi, Bill, blah, blah, blah. And he says, you know, I'd, I'd like to get into the movies and I'd like to make Westerns. And Ince says, well, oh, you know, they, they've had their day. They're, they're a drug on the market. <laughs> No one wants to see them anymore. And uh, Bill, not to be dissuaded, says, well, look, can I talk to you tomorrow? So the two men have a meeting. They go out to uh, what's called Innsville, which was a, a big set uh, out in the Santa Monica area. And they talk. And finally, uh, Bill is able to persuade Ince to let him come back in a year, as soon as he's through with his uh, contracted plays. And to try making a couple of films and Ince agrees. And really that's now, that'd be 1914. And that's when Bill Hart's life changes. It's when screen history changes. The thing that Hart did that hadn't been done before or since really is that he, because of his uh, experience, he brought accuracy to the roles. The, instead of the, uh, the sheriff dressed like a fisherman, he would have people wear the correct clothes. And I know he would like uh, uh, not have the water trucks in, come in and knock down the dust because he wanted dust in the, in the image. He wanted realism and that's what he brought. Now, Jeff, how did Hart learn about the old West so that he could make these accurate films? He was born uh, back East in New York and uh, his parents were rather nomadic, okay? His dad was on what they call a miller. He worked at sawmills and flour mills, wherever the jobs might come, uh, repairing these machi this machinery and wherever the job would take him, that's where they went. Uh, they ended up moving into the um, Midwest for, for a bit, uh, Illinois, around the Great Plains. But, uh, and during that time, he really had no formal training, no real school training, because they were so nomadic and moving around. Uh, they went into Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, the Black Hills, Kansas, all that sort of stuff. But as a kid, um, again, he didn't have regular uh, schoolmates. He didn't have regular uh, friends that he played with. Uh, and during that period of time, you're talking 1874, 75, roughly in that neighborhood, um, 
you know, the plains, that area was still inhabited by an, a lot of Indians and they weren't all friendly, uh, but those were the kids that were around. So he learned uh, to play games with the Indians, the, the children um, that uh, they taught him that. Uh, they also taught him, uh, he wanted to learn uh, the Sioux language. So they helped him a little bit with that. It wasn't an extensive vocabulary, uh, but he did sign language and he did learn some of the, the vocabulary. So, um, and that would come to play um, very helpful later on in, in his, uh, as he was growing up. But he would also see, you know, the bar life. He would see the cow hands. He would see the West as it really, really was still alive at that time. And uh, he, he really sucked it up like a sponge, um, everything. He was always that way. Um, and he was also uh, a kind of guy that, uh, you know, always looking for new endeavors and learning things. So uh, and I mentioned the language part. There was one incident uh, where his, his father, he and his father uh, came upon a war party. Actually, the war party came upon them uh, and circled them. And it was frightening because they were, had their war paint on and everything. But uh, Bill, um, a young Bill, just started you know, chatting and, and mumbling in the Sioux language. The Sioux were uh, taken back by that. And uh, their, their, their way of expressing it is that they would take their right hand and they put it over their mouths uh, in astonishment. So that sort of uh, warmed the, uh, the, the climate and um, they were able to talk themselves out of a situation there with that war party. Uh, so it was kind of neat that that happened. And later in his pictures, uh, you mentioned the wanting to be authentic. Not only did he want the clothing to, to be authentic, he wanted to have um, a storyline that was reasonably true to what being a pioneer, being a homesteader uh, in the West was like. Bill's character itself, um, you know, there was, th there was a lot of truth to him, but there was also, I mean, it, it was a movie and there were a lot of liberties that were taken, but that's what you did in the movies back then. So um, it was always important for him to to do that. Uh, Bill is a point, at one point was a bushwhacker, a bullwhacker, I beg your pardon, moving some cattle in Texas. So there were all sorts of different things that he learned um, that he later uh, took up and used in his pictures to try and be authentic. Now we've talked about his childhood. Thank you, Jeff. And, and, and a little bit about his movie career. What happened in between? I, I, did he start out as a movie actor, Roger? No, in fact, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, Jeff mentioned that, that uh, Bill had had this opportunity as a, as a young fellow to go uh, out to the Dakota Territory with his father, and, but uh, that didn't last for too long. They had to come back east because the mother and the other children had been left uh, back east. Uh, the mother, uh, Rosanna, was uh, frequently ill and so uh, in answer to your question, at about age 15, uh, the whole family is now reunited and they're in New York City, uh, a long ways from the West. And in fact, Bill would not be going back out West again for a very, very long time. So uh, at 15, he drops out of school. And I think that was mentioned that he didn't have much formal schooling and, and what he had was pretty poor. So uh, he had to help his family uh, just financially. And he becomes uh, a messenger, a foot messenger for a couple of uh, the hotels. And this was a person who would run messages from place to place, deliver messages. You know, we, we don't have the telephone or anything of that type. So, uh, but Bill was very athletic and uh, was known for his walking, running ability already. So he takes this job on as a messenger and he just by chance happens to deliver messages to uh, a number of people who are actors or actresses. And uh, in appreciation, they would sometimes give him a pass, uh, a theater pass to come see one of their plays. So, you know, here he is, he's a young guy, 15 years old. And what does he get? He is theater plays and that had to be great amusement. And so he starts going and watching the plays and, really gets taken by them. And so he goes to his father and says, you know, uh, dad, Nicholas, he said, you know, I, 
I've been doing uh, deliveries. I've been going to uh, see stage plays and, and I'm interested in it. I think I would like to be an actor uh, as my profession, uh, a theatrical actor. And uh, Nicholas was very supportive of his, of his children. And so he suggested that that sounded reasonable. He says, look, you didn't have a good education. So that sounds like a good alternative. But he said, you've got some rough edges. You, you, you've got to learn a little bit more about the world if you're going to be successful. So Bilt actually takes two trips to Europe where he works his way over to Europe uh, on the boats. And uh, Nicholas's advice was, look, once you get over there, see everything you can that's free. If there's a museum, uh, go and see it. If there's an art show, go see it. If it's beautiful uh, sculptures or cathedrals, go and visit them, anything you can do. And so Bill on a very limited amount of money went over first at about age 16, if you can believe that. Wow. Came back after a couple of months, he was homesick, works a couple more years and still has the same want to get into the theater. So now he goes back to Europe a second time, but this time he takes some acting lessons and that really got things going. Hmm. So now he returns to the United States. So he's about 18, 19 years of age and he takes some more acting lessons back in New York. And by the very late 1880s, uh, he is getting bit plays that he's doing. He applies and is hired to do little bit parts, has to put together his own costume and everything. By the 1890s, in the middle of the 1890s, he's getting some starring roles in some of the plays. So his, his purpose was you know, well suited for what he, he wanted to do and he now was being successful. The sad part is his, his dad passes away at about 1895. So he sees that Bill is achieving, but he doesn't see the ultimate achievements. Oh. So we jump ahead a few more years and now we turn the century, we're up to 1903. And as I mentioned, he was doing some Western plays, uh, The Squaw Man being the first one. And he had good reviews of that. Then he did The Virginia and then The Trail of the Lonesome Pine and so forth. And he continues doing stage plays, getting better and better and traveling the whole country. And then he has this, as we saw, said earlier, the opportunity of seeing a Western movie and deciding, I think I'd like to get into the movies. So at 50 years of age, he's really now a very well uh, settled stage actor. He decides I'm gonna give up the stage and I'm gonna try something else. Let, let's get into his movie career some then. Uh, Jeff, can you tell us, can you expand more on what his movie era was like? You know, Hart was an interesting man. He was very uh, energetic, and but he was always looking ahead. He wanted to um, grow. And again, as I said, he, he absorbed everything around him. So when he got out to, to uh, California, he saw Ince. Ince showed him more about the movie making. Uh, gave him a couple of, of, um, of a bit parts and some two reelers. And that even sealed the deal for Hart. I have to come to California. I want to make movies. This is my opportunity. And he always seized opportunity. So he went back East, finished up his, uh, in fact, he did not renew his contract to do uh, the play that he had been doing. He uh, brought his sister back out and started uh a new life in, in, in Los Angeles. Well, um, one of the first movies that he did for Thomas Ince was a thing called The Bargain. It became a very successful movie. But again, he was, he was uh, you know, he was 49 years old, 50 years old. Um, uh, his, his, his next thing that he wanted to do is that he, the more that he learned about it, uh, he decided that he wanted to direct uh, so he, he went to Ince and he said, I want to direct the movie. So with that, um, Ince gave him an opportunity um, and he directed a movie called In the Sagebrush Country. Uh, and as, as I said, Ince, uh, uh, Hart was, a, was a, a, a fast climber. He learned everything quickly. Uh, he eventually became a, a producer of his own movies. Um, 
one of the first movies that he did as, as a producer of his own company, the first, uh, the William S. Hart Productions, as he called it, was a thing called The Nero Trail, shot in 1917. Interestingly enough, uh, that movie was shot out at what was called, at that time, Iverson Family Farm. And that Ivers Iverson Family Farm was in the San Fernando Valley. That farm eventually became Iverson Movie Ranch and many, 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 many movies, silent and uh, talkies uh, and television shows um, took place out there. It's just, it's I mean, the Roy Rogers show. You could just get into all sorts of famous movies that were done there too. Anyway, so the Narrow Trail was a, was a real groundbreaker for him. Um, he had made a deal uh, to deliver 16 pictures a year um, to his distributors and things, and he made $150,000 a week. Now that, that figure seems to be a little bloated to me, but that's what we've read, this is what we've learned. Um, his uh, movie career continued. He did, um, I think it was 70 movies in 14 years, um, um, because he was only in the, in the movie business um, as an actor from 14 to 25. So that's, I guess, 11 years, not 14. But the movies that he did were not all Westerns. Uh, he did some other movies. But uh, of course, he's best known for being a, a Western uh, movie star. And, and we talk about the, uh, some of the movies were shot out at, uh, here in Santa Clarita. Um, one uh, in particular that comes to mind is a, a movie called Three Word Brand, shot in 1921. Um, it was shot in, in, at, his, at what eventually became his Newhall Ranch. It was, he actually shot Three Word Brand before um, he obtained the properties out there. But he was so taken with Santa Clarita and, and things like that. So he did as much shooting out here as he could. But obviously, he traveled uh, not only to Iverson, but out of the state uh, to do these movies because he wanted as much authenticity as he could. Um, his success was uh, pretty phenomenal. Uh, in 1917, um, he was uh, asked to be part of uh, war bond drives uh, to collect money for the, for the war. Uh, he went on four war bond drives. They raised, he raised $2 million. On the first drive, he raised $2 million in 10 days, which was more money than had ever been um, gathered. So he went out on a second and a third and a fourth. And by the time the fourth uh, war drive uh, ended up in New York in Times Square, uh, 250,000 people showed up to see Bill and to support the war drive. He continued on and, and made um, many more movies after that. His last movie, Tumbleweeds, was uh, in 1925. And that's the movie that he's most known for. But um, the uh, exteriors for that movie were shot in, at Universal City here in Los Angeles. Gosh, I feel like there's so much we need to cover still, but I, I do want to get to uh, the point, the sort of the point of this new Hollywood Film Festival. It's subtitled Scandals and Tragedies. And when I first heard that, I thought there's no connection to heart with scandals and tragedies. But the more I thought about it, I think there may have been. Uh, Roger, Jeff, any anything come to mind? Uh, scandals and tragedies related to William S. Hart? Where did they take Bill's life and kind of put it again in, in historical perspective? I, I feel very definitely from my reading of my life East and West and, and what I know of the man is that he felt very deeply for his parents. It, it was a very warm family. It was a large family. They had lost several children, which was normal in those days to illnesses of different types, but they were very close. And I, I know that he wanted his father to be proud of him. And I think it was a tragedy that Nicholas died uh, in 1895 before Bill had accomplished as much as he was going to do in the theater. He, he was no one, but he was not the theater star that he would become. Uh, secondly, uh, after Nicholas dies and Bill continues on with his acting career in, in the theater, uh, this goes on, he becomes very well known and his mother lives to see that. She dies in 1909. So Rosanna 
sees her son as a success, but she has no idea of what was to come next. And that was the movies. And I, I think that Bill would feel, you know, how sad it was that his mother and father did not live to realize what a phenomenal son they had mm-hmm. and how, how successful he was and how popular and, and well-liked he was. So I would say a personal tragedy in Bill's life there. Secondly, because he was a theater actor and they kept changing from city to city to city to do the plays, he never had time to start the family of his own that he so wanted to have. And so I think here again, because he had had grown up in this large and loving family and was accustomed to that, uh, it was not something that he in his own personal life ever achieved. Mm. So that kind of was was a tragedy also. Uh, There were stories that came out that said that Bill had the the habit of proposing to his leading ladies. <laughs> maybe he's making a stab in the dark and, you know, maybe this will work out. And I guess he did it with some frequency because it became kind of a joke. He was a ladies man. Come on, say it, Roger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he is offering uh, his hand in marriage to these different starless who were much younger than himself. They uh, evidently did not take him totally seriously, but it, it did spark some rumors without a doubt. Then 1919, uh, he's hit with a paternity suit. Whether it was true or not, it did not go very far and uh, it was tossed out. Then there were rumors also that he must have a bunch of mistresses. I mean, after all, he was a good popular guy with a lot of money. But here again, we don't have any real proof of this, whether he, he did or did not. So this brings us up to another tragedy. He's 57 years of age. And uh, one of his leading ladies who'd been in five of his movies with him was Jane Novak. Jane was, I think, 24 years of age. Bill is 57. He proposes, she takes him seriously and accepts. And he is thrilled. I mean, just totally, totally thrilled. Something happens. She had been married before. She was going through a divorce and she had a three-year-old child. About six months into the uh, engagement, shortly before they were to marry, something happened and the marriage was called off. The engagement was broken and Bill was very despondent about this, very upset. It passed him too far because a couple months later, he proposes again this <laughs> to a 21 year old. Uh, Jane was 24, so he goes for the younger women. This one's <laughs> 20, and uh, her name was Winifred Westover. They got married. They married in December of the same year that he had already gone through uh, the engagement and the breaking of it with Jane. Well, by the end of that year, he is married, but to a different woman. He was 57, so, she was 22. Okay. And he met her during, a, he sh- they were making a movie called Johnny Petticoats in, in, in 1919. So they got married and uh, they moved into his home in Los Angeles, which he shared, by the way, with his sister, Mary. And this was not going to work out. We got two <laughs> women in the same house and you can imagine the consequences. Six months later, Winifred is kicked out of the house. He orders her out to uh, go and live with her mother. Uh, There's been problems. And so uh, she does, and, but she does so pregnant. And so three, about three months after she moves out, she is going to have a child, uh, Bill Jr. So Bill does have a son, an heir, But unfortunately, he is now going through a divorce, a very nasty and lengthy divorce. And in 1927, the divorce was finalized and uh, Winifred was given sole custody of the child. So Bill rarely got to see his child 
he did pay for support, but here again, another personal tragedy. I mean, it, just the guy just did not have good luck with, with the women. Well, it was he, their divorce was a very ugly divorce. Yes, it was. Um, it finally, it, it took them almost seven years, six years to six to seven years uh, for them to finalize this divorce. And she finally had to take it to Nevada, I think, to have it uh, accomplished. So that was, and, and throughout the years, uh, even after they got divorced, um, it was not friendly at all. He didn't get to see his son very often, although Bill Jr. Uh, did come uh, out to the house that we know of here in the San Santa Clarita Valley uh, and visited once or twice. It, it all kind of went down from, from the time of the marriage failing and the uh, divorce uh, being finalized but not seeing his child and then his movie career during that time period also has come to an end. And then right about that time, one of his best friends, uh, Charlie Russell, the artist, passes away. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, his friend, Wyatt Earp, the lawman, passes away. And then Will Rogers, another good friend of his, uh, the humorist, passes away. And then one of the big hits on, on Bill was his movie horse, Fritz, dies. And from 1943 on, he was extremely saddened and despondent and his health fails. He just has to have a nurse come in to take care of him at the house. So 1943, things pretty much came to an end for poor Bill Hart. Uh, he was a complicated man, but what really stood out to me was that at his core, he was a loyal man. He was exceedingly patriotic as was mentioned with the war bond drives. He was very generous to his fans. You can't believe how many books I've seen that he has signed with little notations in them. And he was very generous to his community. He had said, when, when I was making movies, folks gave me the, their nickels, dimes, and quarters, which is what it used right. to cost them to do a movie. And right. when I'm gone, I want them to have my home. He willed his home to right. the county of Los Angeles and, and, and the son and the former wife tried to take it away and make it theirs. Eh, there's all kinds of things. But like you said, Roger, he was ultimately a, a good and talented man. And we're proud to have him as part of our um, uh, community. I want, to sh I want to show off. Roger's not the only one with historic books. I have The Treasure of Chicken Cook Cookery by Jane Novak. And we've actually made recipes out of it. And it's really good. If I can interrupt. Yeah, please. please. Since we're I was going to ask if you guys had anything else. I, I wanted to share uh, that. Yes. Uh, anybody that's interested in, in Bill Hart's movies, you want to learn more about when they were shot, where they were shot, um, how much it costs to make these things. Uh, you know, this goes through all of Bill's movies, and it's really, really a terrific uh, um, book to have. You'll learn a whole lot from it. We have both of those books at the Friends of Hart Park gift store. Trading Post gift store in Hart Park, unfortunately closed at this moment because of COVID. But for those who are really interested, we do have virtually all of the 11 books that Bill and Mary wrote. Many of them are signed copies. Thank you guys. I wanna thank my guests here, Jeff Wheat and Roger Basham for their insight into the silent movie star, William S. Hart. Um, and we want to thank you folks you silent film fans that have joined us here at the New Hollywood Silent Film Festival. It's been fantastic to have you be a part of this. Um, in a way, it's kind of neat to do this all online. We all get to be together virtually, all us film fans. Um, for, for you film fans that know the name William S. Hart but haven't seen his movies, uh, I have homework for you. Check out his final and many consider his best movie, Tumbleweeds. Uh, the other thing that's neat about Tumbleweeds, most DVDs, DVD copies include a spoken intro that Hart filmed behind his house in Newhall. Um, and this intro has sound. So in it, he says goodbye to the movie industry and goodbye to you, his fans. Stick around for the next segment of the new Hollywood Silent Film Festival, where we're showing an extremely rare Hart film, 1919's Square Deal Sanderson. 
it features original uh, music composed by Ray Lowe. And I cleaned up the 160 title uh, cards, which were in many cases illegible, um, uh, while still maintaining the artwork that was originally in the title cards. Uh, the result is a version of Square Deal Sanderson that can't be seen anywhere else. So if you uh, would hang around and be sure and catch that. If you were interested in a DVD copy of Square Deal Sanderson, this version, uh, we produced a limited run of these. And you can, for details on how to purchase, email us at w-e-l-o-p-r-o-d at gmail.com. That's uh, Ray's and my last names. We're not good at coming up with, with names. We, Weloprod.com and we'll tell you how to order. Finally, and again, uh, um, a proof that silent movie actor William S. Hart had a beautiful speaking voice. Stick around and we're gonna, we found some outtakes, uh, a blooper reel, if you will, from a Fox Movie Tone newsreel episode where Hart tries to describe Indian hand talk, but it's pretty funny to watch Hart upstaged by his pinto pony Fritz and his mule Lisbeth. So again, thank you to Roger Basham and Jeff Weed. Do you guys have anything to add at the end? Uh, one other thing I would toss in since you mentioned uh, the DVDs, we do have a collection of about 20 of Hart's DVDs at uh, our gift store. Yeah. Thank you, and, yes. Again, unfortunately, it's, it's closed at the present time, but we do have a very nice collection of mementos that are associated with Bill Hart, including the uh, stamp that came out several years ago. Well, thank you again, Jeff and Roger, and let's check out a blooper reel of Hart getting up staged by his pony and his mule. All right, You gotta behave now. I want to speak to these ladies and gentlemen. Be quiet. Hey. My friends. You better take it over, brother. My friends, please may I put my hat on. I, I can think better with my hat on. It sort of, sort of holds my brains together. My friends, I'm mighty glad to see you all. And I'm mighty glad to have you all see the little paint and to know that he's well and happy here on his ranch. Because he owns it. Uh, my friends, when I was a little boy, it was my good fortune to be brought up on the frontier. When we left that country, it was the late fall of the year. There was snow on the ground. A Sioux Indian came up to my father. <laughs> God, you left. My friends, go ahead, paint. Please may I put my hat on. I can, I can think better with my hat on. It sort of holds my brains together. I'm mighty glad to see you all, my friends. And I'm mighty glad to have you all see the little pimple horse and to know that he is well and happy 
here on his ranch. My friends, when I was a little boy, it was my good fortune to be brought up in the Sioux Indian country. When we left that country, it was the late fall of the year. There was snow on the ground. A blanket Sioux Indian came up to my father and took off his moccasins and stood with his bare feet in the snow and said to my father in Hantop, but first I must tell you that Hantop on the frontier was a universal language. But first I must tell you on the frontier, there is a universal language called Hantok, which is understood by all the different tribes of Indians. For example, uh, can't you go on the barn? Go on, you're a nuisance. Go on, go on to the barn. Go on to the barn. Go ahead. Dog gone you. For example, the Sioux, Crows, Cheyennes, whatever they may be, they all speak a different tongue. And there's a universal language called Hantok, which is also understood by the whites. Well, this Indian, he said to my father in Hantok, well, first I will make the signs and then I will explain to you. And I will explain to you what they do mean. My friends, in conclusion, will you kindly allow me to quote the last two lines of my recently published autobiography, My Life East and West? I will speak it in the Sioux town. It means, my friend, you on a long trail. I speak out to you through my heart. My heart is very low on the ground. That, my friends, is the spirit of this, the West, the land of staunch comradeship, the land of kindly sympathy, the land of kindred intellect, where hearts beat high and hands grasp firm, where poverty is no disgrace, and where charity never grows cold. Mita. O e habele, shanku shang shang, ye yin na e ante. Meaning, trail, long, winding to land of dreams. I think.